Okay, we are back. <clears throat> so, um, we have been looking at uh, this uh, Gongji commentary. Uh, translated here in this book called The Buddha's Single Intention. Yeah? Uh, this book, The Buddha's Single Intention, um, contains uh, one of the key commentaries uh, for this collection of Vajra statements uh, called uh, Gongjik, uh, Vajra Statements by Gyobhaji Densungan. Um, and the commentary translated here is called Nimanangwa, or the light of the sun. And Nima Nangwa, light of the sun. And this Nima Nangwa was composed uh, by uh, the 21st throne holder of Dugong Kagyu, um, Rigzin Choki Drakpa. Uh, Rigzin Chodra, um, he lived uh, basically in the 17th century. Uh, contemporaneous with the time of the fifth Dalai Lama. Uh, very tumultuous, difficult times in Tibet uh, during that time. Uh, the Mongols have become very involved uh, in Tibetan uh, affairs. Uh, in fact, the Mongols uh, came uh, at least a hundred years before that and had become very involved in um, affairs in Tibet. Uh, involved, I guess, is a polite word uh, to use. Uh, the Mongols were basically um, marching up and down all over Tibet, um, taking over, um, destroying monasteries, rebuilding monasteries, uh, all of that. Mm. When they destroy monasteries, they were not uh, destroying monasteries because monasteries represented Buddhism. They were destroying monasteries um, in, as a way to uh, kind of neutralize uh, any kind of uh, political challenge. Mm, and this goes to show, you know, that by the 17th century, um, politics and religion have been so uh, interconnected in Tibet. Um, so that's, you know, the case of Tibet. Uh, anyway, uh, with the material that we're looking at, we're looking at a very early uh, period uh, of uh, Buddhism in Tibet. Uh, so the Vajra statements were compiled uh, basically uh, in the 13th century, uh, soon after the passing away of Gyoba Jidinsungun, which was in 1217. Uh, in 1217 was when Gyobhaji Tinsumgo passed away. Um, and after he passed away, his uh, most uh, closest uh, disciple, kind of like an ananda to him, uh, he uh, compiled these Vajra statements, uh, which is about 197 to 200 uh, statements. Uh, these statements are not um, the different early uh, manuscripts of the Gongchik uh, have some differences in terms of how many verses and the wording of these verses uh, statements, not verses. <clears throat> uh, these were just statements. So anyway, we have been looking at the introduction uh, by Professor uh, Solbish. Uh, who translated uh, this volume. <clears throat> I want to mention this, um, that if you are in uh, Mexico or in Guatemala, mm, you guys can order from Wisdom Publication and do it as a Dharma Center order and get a discount. Uh, so, you know, if you want details about that, please let me know. Uh, and then um, I will send you the information of how to order, uh, you have to order in, you know, uh, not just one book, uh, several books together, and then you can get a Dharma Center uh, discount. Uh, it's a good discount uh, that might make up for the 
um, shipping costs that you need <laughs> to spend uh, to ship this to Guatemala or Mexico. Um, it, it's a pretty hefty book. Um, uh, there might be Kindle versions, uh, but I don't know when that those versions will become available. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, um, let's see. Uh, we were looking now. Uh, we finished looking at the uh, life of uh, Cuba Rinpoche uh, very briefly, and now we are starting to look at the section. Uh, by Sobish, in which he tries to give us an overview of some of the key issues, uh, the key themes that uh, one can find in the Gongjik. Uh, this is very useful uh, to give us a, an orientation, so to say, uh, to this uh, important uh, body of teachings. Uh, but nonetheless, keep in mind, uh, this is uh, Professor Sobish's um, kind of summary. So um, we can, you know, see that this is what he has learned. Uh, and he has studied this text with um, many different uh, experts as well. So of course, you know, his opinion uh, is a very educated opinion. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's his opinion. Yeah. So we are at page, uh, we were at around page uh, 27. Under this section called Single Essences, Teachings and Intentions. Somewhere in the middle of page 27, uh, look for the part that says a well-known example is the teaching of the levels three levels of ground path and result uh, so here mm, right before this if you recall if you were with us uh, the last couple of classes mm, uh, here uh, Sobish uh, right before this was discussing how uh, from the Gongchik perspective uh, the, or the Gongchik presents this argument uh, Gongchik presents this view uh, that this understanding that um, all 84,000 teachings of the Buddha uh, have one single intention makes a one single point. And this one single point uh, is not like a, you know, something that you can summarize in one statement, but rather what it's pointing, what, what this means, uh, what this expression means is that all the teachings are, <clears throat> are ways in which the Buddha <clears throat> is leading us to understand this fundamental nature, this single essence, and uh, this one uh, essence of all reality. Now, of course, this essence, we should not think of it as some sort of God, some sort of force like that. It's not that. Uh, but this essence is said to be one, not in the sense that there's only one, uh, but that it is same. Uh, so the, the Tibetan word chik, uh, chikpa, uh, chik can also can mean one, literally like one as opposed to two, three, four, and five. It also means same. So when it says, you know, all phenomena has chikpa uh, essence, it, can say, it means that on the essence level, they all have the same qualities. And they all have the same nature. It does not have to mean, it's, and it does not mean that they are all one thing. Uh, the idea that we are all one, uh, like literally we are all one, uh, is more a way of expression common among Hindus. Even when Buddhists talk about one or single essence, uh, it is not talking about how we were originally one and then we um, kind of separated 
due to uh, confusion, then we uh, separate it into many. And the goal is for all the many uh, to kind of dissolve into the one and become the one. We have to be clear that this is not uh, the Buddha's, uh, what the Buddha taught. This particular understanding is not what is meant by a single essence or we all have the same nature or we all have the same essence. Here is saying that we all have the same qualities. And these qualities, uh, we call it qualities uh, because we're speaking from the perspective of uh, a, a being uh, with awareness, with consciousness. If you're speaking of it from the perspective of like uh, inanimate objects, like this table, this couch, and this prayer wheel, then we don't speak so much of qualities. The context is different. Then we, we might say like the, 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 uh, the, the, the way that they truly exist, you know, how they exist, how they are, is no different from how our mind is, how we are. It has the same essence, the same nature. Yeah. So right here, right at this section, um, he is going to use the example of uh, this very common way of talking about what uh, Buddhist practice consists of. It consists of uh, understanding the ground and then uh, embarking on the path and then arriving at the result. So on the middle of page 27, ground, path, and result. So here I'm going to continue reading. A well-known example is the teaching of the three levels of ground, path, and result. It splits up the single essence, which is not yet realized by the disciple, into three phases, three parts, three phases. First phase, second Third, the ground, which is the mind of the yet unawakened being with all its potentials. The path, which provides the means for awakening. And the result, which is the state of having awake, awoken, which is Buddhahood. And so this is how it's normally explained. Uh, the ground is the mind right now, uh, mixed up with confusion, uh, but nonetheless, potential to be awake is there. That is the ground that we're working with. When we start on the path, we begin to clarify, uh, to purify, to remove the confusion, the stains. The result is when all the stains and the confusion uh, remove. And so this is ground, path, and result, sometimes literally translated as fruit. So here, uh, Sobish continues, if we apply this three-level perspective to the teaching of Mahamudra, which is the topic here, Gongchik is about Mahamudra, it's about nature of mind, it is as follows. Ground Mahamudra is the naturally pure element <clears throat> that is free of all proliferation. Ground Mahamuddha is the pure element, is Buddha nature uh, in sutra language. In secret mantra language, it's um, like the deity, uh, we might say that. Path Mahamudra is such that all conceptualized dichotomies arising and cessation, abandoning, accepting, hope, fear, samsara, nirvana, subject, object, and so on, are in the realization of the nature of mind, non-dual. That they are not two. I find it interesting that in, <clears throat> in Buddhist lit, uh, material, <clears throat> they are more likely to say uh, non-dual, not two, uh, rather than to say one. Uh, so in a way, it is not saying that it's one. 
It's just saying that it is not two, as in it is not based on this um, opposites. Or, or rather the opposites, right? They are only opposites uh, if we don't understand that they rely on each other uh, to have meaning. They rely on each other uh, to stand together. I use the example of like uh, card tents, you know, like putting two, uh, two playing cards, right? You, you, you put them together so that they press up against each other so then they can stand. But when you take one away, the other falls off. So when we think about arising and ceasing, uh, samsara and nirvana, right? All of these, it's not saying that they absolutely don't exist, but it is saying that they exist interdependent. Uh, they rely on each other. Uh, and therefore, in that way, uh, non-dual. Uh, they're not opposed per se. Now, there's a lot more to be said about this. Huh? Like I said, this is just the introduction. And don't expect to know everything. Like it will all become very clear. You know, I don't have the skill to explain it to become so clear. And then ultimately, it it is not so easily understood. If it was, then we are Buddhists now. Yeah. So ultimately, the path is only that realization. So what is really the path is to completely, thoroughly realize that these, these dichotomies, arising, cessation, abandoning, accepting, hope, fear, samsara, nirvana, subject, object, and so forth, that they are non-dual. And so in this context, what is the path? The path is working on achieving this realization and its habituation, and meaning not just realize, right? you, you might realize it, you might have a glimpse of it, but then you need to continue in your practice in order to completely uh, habituate it, completely stabilize it. So, that all, so the process of stabilizing or habitualizing is actually a process of removing all the adventitious uh, stains. Uh, all the stains that don't belong uh, to the diamond, so to say. Uh, and you do that in a state of non-proliferation. You do it in a state of uh, not further stirring up or adding uh, ideas, concepts. You purify that. Finally, result Mahamudra is such that, quote, nothing is to be practiced, no means of practice are employed. The perfection of habituation to the realization of the mind is called actualization of the Dharmakaya, the absolute state of non-proliferation. Uh, so this word habituation, I want to call attention to this word. This is an important word, especially in uh, Mahamudra, uh, in Gagyu Mahamudra, and then especially uh, in the way Jidin uh, teaches. In fact, you could say habituation is, is, is the most important point. Even like the, the realizing the nature of mind, which is that initial, very important um, step where for the first time you understand something about the nature of your mind, not just uh, how the mind works on the monkey mind level, but understanding something about the nature of mind. That is very important, and that's called the realization of nature of mind. But realization of nature of mind isn't, isn't yet the fruit, isn't, isn't yet the actualization of the dharmakaya. To actualize the dharmakaya, we have to habituate the realization. We have to habituate what has been realized. Hmm? Or maybe you can say what has been glimpsed. Hmm? It's sort of like saying, you know, you, you, you catch a glimpse of the sun. Hmm? You catch a glimpse of the sun. 
but right now, because you are within yeah, a building uh, where this window is your only way you can see the sun, uh, but somehow you caught a glimpse of the sun, uh, but then you still have to clean the window completely so that the full extent uh, of the warmth and the brightness of the sun can completely illuminate the darkness that you are in. So having caught a glimpse of the sun, that is realizing nature of mind. Uh, but you cannot like just say, oh, I caught a glimpse of the sun. Now I'm content to be in the darkness of this room uh, because I have caught a glimpse of the sun. So I will operate in this darkness uh, by having a lot of faith and trust uh, in the brightness of the sun. Uh, that obviously is not uh, very helpful in the long run. Because why? Because then, you know, after a few days, maybe even uh, if you're good, very good at having faith and confidence, maybe it'll last a few weeks, but eventually uh, you are still in the dark and you no longer have this trust uh, in the sun that you have caught a glimpse. But if you caught a glimpse of the sun, uh, which is you know, this, this brief realization of nature of mind, and before this brief realization wears off, uh, you have to habituate. And here habituate means, uh, the analogy would be polishing that window, cleaning that window, knowing that the sun is coming in from this big window uh, in front of you, uh, you, then you start polishing. And polish, 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 until uh, this window becomes completely clear. Then the full extent of the brightness and the warmth of the sun can be experienced without uh, any uh, obstacles anymore. Mm. And an all, an, a comparable uh, approach, I think, is found, in my opinion, and this is just my limited understanding and opinion. Mm. <clears throat> in the uh, Chan or Zen tradition, mm, Starting from the um, around the time of around seven eighth century, um, the Chan or Zen communities in Asia began to um, get into these debates as to what is the relationship between sudden and gradual. Because this um, expression of sudden, uh, the sudden path and the gradual path, uh, we find this expression in, in Tibetan too, right? Like the gradual path is the path of sutra uh, and the sudden path is a path of secret mantra. So in the East Asian context, uh, they also got into this kind of debate about sudden and gradual. So in one key text, uh, one text that will become key uh, to the Chan tradition in later generations, is a text called uh, the, the Platform Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch. Uh, this platform is referring to uh, like the, the location where someone gives the precepts, gives ordination, and gives teachings. And so I think the equivalent in the Tibetan context might be something like uh, the platform sutra will be something like, you know, the sutra taught from the throne, uh, like the teaching throne. Uh, so the platform. Um, and this platform sutra is attributed to the sixth patriarch of the Chan tradition in China. And in there, he talks about, he addresses the issue. He says, um, um, I, I'll briefly summarize, which is to say that both him and another very important and famous monk of his time, both of them studied with a great uh, Chan or meditation master. Chan means meditation. Uh, studied with the same meditation master who later is called the fifth patriarch, like the fifth lineage master. Um, so both the 
both these individuals, huh, the, the author, well, the supposed author of the Platform Sutra and another famous monk, they both studied uh, with the fifth lineage master. And then they both claimed to be uh, the successor you know, or the main successor. Uh, so for a while, there are some debates, you know, who is exactly uh, the main lineage holder, as we would say in Tibetan, uh, after the fifth. So in the text that we have today called the Platform Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch, it presents uh, the less known one, uh, Hui Neng, uh, as the Sixth Patriarch, and the more famous one during that time, at least, uh, uh, Shen Xiu. Uh, Shen Xiu is considered um, not the main successor, according to the, 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 the Platform Sutra. Anyway, in there, in the Platform Sutra, the, the, the Hui Neng said, you know, you guys are debating a lot about sudden and gradual. And in fact, uh, uh, the common understanding is that I teach the sudden path and the other uh, master, uh, the famous one, teach the gradual path. So it seems like this debate became very strong during that time. But in the Platform Sutra itself, you see the Sixth Patriarch uh, saying this. He says, actually, as far as the Buddha's teachings is concerned, there is no division into sudden and gradual, he says. He says, sudden and gradual is based on the capacity of the disciples. When the Buddha taught, the Buddha always just taught uh, the single dharma. Uh, but when the disciples hear them and receive them, they hear and receive the dharma in accordance to their level of capabilities. Uh, so he says, you know, the dharma doesn't have sudden or gradual. The dharma doesn't have northern or southern. Because at that time, his tradition is called the southern tradition, like direction. The southern, southern direction, the gradual northern direction. But even in the Platform Sutra, he, he's, he, he's saying, he said, you know, these divisions are superficial. And these divisions are just based on the capacity of the students to absorb the single dharma that the Buddha has taught. So he said, you know. Get, get over uh, these, these terms. Get over these and don't say, you know, uh, over here the Buddha taught the gradual way, over here the Buddha taught the sudden way. All the Buddha taught is just the single dharma uh, that liberates us. But the capacity of the students to absorb the single dharma then gives rise to all these differences. So I think it's very similar here. And then even more so, uh, fast forward about a hundred years or so, one of the successors of uh, Hui Neng, uh, he were to articulate this notion of hmm, sudden and gradual uh, as one pair, and on top of that, uh, practice and realization. Sudden and gradual as one pair of terms, then he introduced and he brought together this pair of terms with another pair of terms, which is uh, practice and realization. And he says, when you combine these two pairs, you get four uh, possibilities, uh, four variations. And using those four variations, he gave kind of like an overview of the different ways of practicing Chan during his time. When all these different groups are descendants of Hui Neng, the, the, the main figure in the Platform Sutra. Some of you are familiar with what I'm talking about, and for some of you it's new. It's okay. Don't, don't you know, like if you don't understand completely, again, we're just at the beginning of this material. But this, Anyway, in this case, he said, when you bring sudden and gradual practice and realization together, right, then you have four possibilities. And 
And he looked around, you know, during his time, about 100 years after the Platform Sutra was circulating. He said, you see that you know, even though we all say we are descended from the sixth patriarch, Hui Neng, uh, but the way we understand those teachings uh, are different. And, and then he says, uh, there are those who say that realization is sudden and cultivation or practice is also sudden. Uh, and there are those who say, he says, uh, uh, that practice is gradual. So first you begin with gradual uh, cultivation, and then you attain realization gradually. Then, uh, so sudden cultivation leading to sudden realization. Gradual cultivation leading to gradual realization. Yeah. Then gradual uh, cultivation leading to sudden realization. And then sudden realization followed by gradual cultivation. Now, which one you would say, uh, if we bring this uh, framework to Mahamudra, which one do you say uh, Kagyu Mahamudra is? Sudden cultivation followed by sudden realization, gradual cultivation followed by gradual realization, Gradual cultivation followed by sudden realization. Sudden realization followed by gradual cultivation. Which one you say Kagyu Mahamudra is? Guru? Yes? I think it allows two of the four. Gradual. No, I, you can only have one. Sorry. Oh, in that case, then gradual practice that leads to gradual realization. Ah, sorry, gradual practice that leads to gradual realization. Oh my God. Oh my God. Suddenly, everyone's uh, microphone has been unmuted. I would say gradual. Leonard, can you hold on, hold on. Leonard, can you repeat your position? Gradual practice to sudden realization. Okay. Next, Judy. I would say gradual uh, leading to gradual, resulting in gradual. Okay. Anyone else? I will say gradual cultivation, sudden realization. Gradual cultivation, sudden realization. Um, I would say sudden realization uh, followed by gradual cultivation. Sudden realization followed by gradual cultivation. Anybody else? I would say gradual cultivation by gradual realization. Gradual by gradual. Anybody else? At least I know some people are awake. Are I will ready? say gradual, <laughs> gradual, and gradual. Gradual, gradual, okay. I say the sudden cultivation followed by gradual cultivation. Sudden cultivation, gradual cultivation. Yes. Okay. Yeah, next. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, all of you have to buy Antonio an ice cream. Uh, it's actually, the closest I would say is sudden realization followed by gradual cultivation. Now try to think why.
Is it because of the initial realization or glimpse? Exactly. That's why habituation is a special kind of practice that only starts after the initial realization of nature of mind. The, after the initial introduction uh, and realization of nature of mind, then you have to habituate. And that's the gradual cultivation. Do you understand? Yes. Yes? Yeah, so, yes. so the gradual cultivation leading to sudden enlightenment and gradual cultivation leading to gradual realization, that is uh, the more common way uh, that is understood. But here in the Mahamudra, in the Kagyu Mahamudra, uh, it said that you have to... Uh, you will have, not you have to, but you will, if you follow this path, you will have a sudden realization first with the help of, you know, uh, 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 someone to introduce you to that. And later we'll learn, you know, like for, for the introduction to be effective, what, what are the elements that have to come together? So in that way, you could still say, well, prior to that isn't there gradual cultivation yes there is yeah if you want to really you know uh, map out the whole process then of course uh, there's gradual uh, cultivation as well uh, but here i think it's important for us to understand that in the kagyu mahamudra i say kagyu mahamudra because uh uh, Sakyapas talk about Mahamudra, Gelupas talk about Mahamudra, you know, uh, and uh, they, they are not exactly the same, you know, their understanding of how uh, you practice Mahamudra. It's not exactly the same. <laughs> um, so in Kagyu Mahamudra, this, this, this realization of nature of mind, um, which is something initial, it, it gives you a glimpse of what is. Then after you have this glimpse of what is, then your practice uh, is a different kind of practice than the practices that you do before the realization. And this second type of practice is what's called habituation. to habituate. Anyway, now come back to page 27 at the bottom. Not only is the essence or intention a single one on all levels of ground, path, and result, but it is also one and the same for all kinds of beings, such as Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and ordinary beings. And so here it says, you know, whether we're talking about Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, or uh, confused sentient beings, this essence, or here intention, they are the same uh, for all beings. Uh, Buddhas do not have uh, greater uh, essence, and Hitler, uh, the proverbial Hitler does not have less of that essence. You don't have more of the essence than somebody else or less than somebody else. Thus, because sentient beings are confused and have not realized the state of non-duality free from proliferation, they need to realize the undifferentiated true reality, birthlessness, or Mahamudra. These are synonyms. Undifferentiated true reality, birthlessness, or Mahamudra. Through a path of limitless gates of skillful means. Ah, 
So even though the nature is one, the essence is the same for everyone and in every context. To realize that, to work through, to arrive at that understanding, there is a path of limitless gates of skillful means, limitless methods of skillful means. In sum, even though the single essence or intention cannot ultimately be differentiated into ground, path, and result, unrealized beings need to practice a diversity of means or methods. Thus, the single intention comprises 150 Vajra statements that reveal the one intention from different perspectives. And so, in this context, this is how it is. In this context, this is how it is. In this method, this is how it is. At this point on the path, this is how it is. And when you are experiencing this, this is how it is. Like all of this right, is pointing to that single essence, that single intention. And here it says 150 Vajra statements because the seven chapters is 150 altogether. And then there is a supplementary chapter with 47. So about 200 in total. Any questions or comments regarding what we just covered? Yes, no, maybe. Can you explain a little more what is habit to wait? Because for me, it's the first time that I hear that term. So wait, say that again. What is habit to wait when you refer to habit to wait? Habituate. Uh, to, to get used to. No, it's like a habit. Habit, yeah, from the word habit. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, in fact, Tibetan word for that we translate as meditation, uh, gompa, uh, and uh, a cognate uh, of gompa is something uh, very similar. It's called gompa, and gompa is just one one consonant uh, missing. Uh, but gompa is uh, a meditation, gompa is uh, related to this cognate word gompa. And in the gongchik, uh, in the supplementary statement, uh, there is one Vajra statement uh, where Jiten Sengkwen said, uh, gompa ma yin, gompa yin. Uh, it sounds like the same word, you know, gompa ma yin, gompa yin. Uh, yin is is, ma yin is is not in English. So that statement, Bumba, which is what we normally translate as meditation. He says, meditation, mayin. Meditation is not. Kumbayin. Habituation is. That's the literal translation. Less literal, but the meaning translation, so the, not just the translation of words, but to translate the meaning, what he's saying is, what we call meditation isn't really some exotic thing like meditation, you know, <laughs> but it's simply habituating the nature of mind to get used to the nature of mind. Uh, to express that differently, it is to get used to our Buddha nature. Once we have a glimpse of the Buddha nature, then we need to stay away from the distractions of samsara uh, and get used to our Buddha nature. And then as, as we get used to our Buddha nature, as we habituate uh, our Buddha nature, uh, we begin to see more and more, wow, oh, wow. Uh, then after a while, you don't need to fight the distractions anymore. You begin to see that the distractions huh, 
a meaningless and 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 pointless once you begin to see more and more the qualities of your buddha state then you let go it's sort of saying like you let go of the childish things when you begin to mature into understanding what what is and what is is that buddha state thank you mm -hmm. Dr. Han? Yes. Can you explain what is the four possibility? Mm, what do you mean? Like like back to the Chan tradition, you mean? Just now you're saying practice the realization, you will get four possibility. Oh no, 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 no. I'm I'm saying uh, in the Chan debates, right? In the Chan Zhong debates in the Tang Dynasty, um, when they start to put together uh, sudden and gradual. Uh, practice and realization uh, when you have four put together uh, there are four possibilities four different approach that would arise uh, one approach says uh, you start with gradual practice and then you arrive at gradual realization you start with uh, sudden practice and you arrive at sudden realization or you start with gradual practice. Uh, uh, wait, uh, gradual, uh, wait, <laughs> wait. Mm, sudden practice, sudden realization. Gradual practice, gradual realization. Gradual practice, sudden realization. Sudden realization, gradual practice. Those are the four possibilities. Okay, and I say of those four, Mahamudra is sudden realization followed by gradual practice. Realizing nature of mind, then habituating nature of mind. Thank you. Yeah. And Zhongmi is the one who uh, discussed this. He is the one that and divided all the Chan traditions that he saw around him and, and he put them into these four groups. And he said that um, in his tradition, of, obviously he thinks his tradition is the most authentic. <laughs> he doesn't quite say the others are wrong, but he says uh, the, the intention, uh, the real meaning from the Liu Zhu, uh, the sixth patriarch, Hui Neng, uh, is the one uh, that is in my tradition, and guess which one is his tradition? Of the four choices. Any guesses? Sudden realization and gradual cultivation. Say that again. Sudden realization followed by gradual cultivation. Same. Yes, yeah. Zhongmi actually has a position very similar to Kagyu Mahamudra in, in China. He said, it's sudden realization of, 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 they don't say nature of mind. I guess you could, but they say Buddha nature. Oh, seeing one's nature, he says. You, you, you see, you glimpse your nature, and then now you need to cultivate and exhaust all your Xi uh, Qi. Uh, karmic imprints uh, needs to be exhausted now. Uh, so his his tradition, he says, uh, is the, the the most superior of those four. Uh, he says those who practice sudden practice sudden realization. Uh, those are uh, people who are uh, doing some very dangerous things. Uh, because they don't, they they are they don't uh, pay attention to their moral ethics. They don't pay attention to uh, like uh, consistent, you know, dedicated practice. Uh, because they 
and he he said, you know, may, maybe they can get to Buddha state like that, uh, but very hard because he says uh, they will get sidetracked and they will fall into dangerous situations uh, because they they act, you know, kind of just based on you know whatever comes to mind. Uh, and he says, you know, that's very dangerous. Uh, then he said, the ones who take the Gradual practice, gradual realization, he said, um, it will take a long, 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 long time. And then gradual practice and sudden realization, he says, uh, the problem with that is that it will also take a long, long, long time. Huh? Less long than gradual practice, gradual realization. <laughs> but in the end, he goes back to the six patriarchs uh, text and he said, but in the end, you have to understand it's not that the Buddha actually gave uh, these differences. Uh, he says it's entirely due to uh, the capacities of the trainees, of the disciples. Dr. Lai? Yes. What is the difference between Kagyu Mahamudra and Sakya and Gelok? Oh, I don't know. Uh, all I know is different. So you have to investigate that yourself. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, in the case of, of on the sudden uh, realization and gradual cultivation, uh -huh. uh, it's also in this case, the teacher is very, very important because if it's sudden realization, yes. you don't know uh, if it, this reali realization is correct. So it's very dangerous because the habituation, yes, the cultivation, a gradual, it's, a, it's it's not. I mean, maybe it's leading to another path. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, later uh, we will see. You know, mm, uh, all the elements that have to come together uh, for this sudden realization. Uh, uh, the kindness of a teacher uh, who has the ability to show. Uh, the great merit of the student who has an ability to recognize, uh, and then uh, the proper state of mind of the disciple, uh, also important. Uh, and then we will see also how uh, in this material, uh, it's not as, uh, it's not as, um, as sometimes it's been depicted, you know, like a sudden thing, uh, like, like, uh, you know, walking in the clouds, you know, in some beautiful place, suddenly meeting a teacher and then ta-da, you know, that happens. Uh, uh, as we will see uh, here, uh, it, it, it can be also, you could say, a gradual process to, to arrive at the sudden realization. And even the sudden realization, mm, again, uh, there can be preliminary realizations, such as like, Understanding more and more, right? Uh, what this nature of mind is. So, for example, uh, uh, now talking about on the practical level, mm, most of you have heard, right? The three year retreat, uh, the, um, but not all three year retreats are designed in the same way. Uh, in fact, just as I said, you know, Gagyu Mahamudra methods are different from Sakya and Geluk Mahamudra. Uh, Ningma, they say Mahamudra also, but they're mostly uh, Dzogchen. Uh, Mahamudra is a vocabulary that is found in the Sarma traditions, uh, the texts of the Sarma. Sarma are the new translation, meaning uh, translations and lineages that began around 11th, 12th century, new in that sense, and new compared to the 8th century uh, Nyingma, the old. Uh, the new traditions are obviously Sakya, Kadampa, and Kagyupa. Mm, so in, in, in these material, the word Mahamudra turns up uh, as the, uh, the result of practice, Mahamudra. But in Kagyu, we talk about ground Mahamudra, path Mahamudra, result Mahamudra. Uh, that uh, you don't find. Uh, Sakya Pandita, for example, uh, he says, no, that's nonsense. Uh, Mahamudra is simply the fruit. And when you practice Mahamudra, uh, Sakya Pandita says, 
Uh, it's exclusively a Vajrayana matter. Uh, but in Gagyu Mahamudra, uh, Gampopa said, well, no, actually Mahamudra can be practiced within the Sutra context, can be practiced within the mantra, uh, secret mantra context, and also can be practiced on an essential level that transcends Sutra and mantra. So that to that question, you know, more than that, I'm not able to say. Um, not much skill to understand uh, how Geluk Mahamudra and Sakyapa Mahamudra are Kagyu Mahamudra, some of the characteristics uh, is like this. Now, during, um, now, how this actually uh, kind of occurs. Mm. So you've heard of the three-year retreat, and as I said, you know, not all three-year retreats are designed uh, in the same way, and the content is different. And I would say even the purpose of the different three-year retreats are different. For example, if you look at the vocabulary, uh, the, 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 if you look at the, uh, not vocabulary, sorry, the, the uh, what's the word? The program, if you look at the program, the curriculum of like Karamakagyu uh, three-year retreat, I think it's fair to say that uh, the three-year retreat is designed to train lamas not to train monks, not to train ordinary monks or nuns, but to train those whom they are going to put in the position uh, to go instruct others or uh, to, yeah, to instruct and to become like teachers uh, in their respective communities. And so the Athriya retreat, uh, they learn a lot of things, many, many things. Uh, how to make dharmas, how to do this ritual, how to do that ritual, then some basic teachings on what is the meaning of this ritual, how do you do this, how do you do that. So they go through a lot of material in those three years. And during those three years, uh, they come together quite a bit. It's not solitary. Uh, they, they assemble together, do practice, and they go back to their rooms and do their own practice. Then they assemble together. And again, like they learn make tormas, they learn to make ritual things, and the teacher is there teaching. So three years of very focused training to train future leaders, uh, future spiritual leaders. When you look at Drigunkagyu, uh, uh, Mahamudra, when you look at Drigunkagyu Mahamudra, uh, Drigunkagyu Three Year uh, uh, Retreat, uh, it's different. Uh, the curriculum is very limited. Uh, only a few things are done. And uh, it's not a group practice. Uh, you come together as a group to receive instructions from uh, the retreat master. Then you go back to your own space and you practice, uh, and you practice over time. You practice over time uh, until the teacher said, okay, come back in two weeks. And then again, you know, you gather uh, for teaching session with the teacher and then you go. And then the teacher might say, you have to do a hundred thousand of this or that. Then when you're finished, then you come back and you get more instructions, right? Now, in the days before the exile into India, uh, in Drigung Til Monastery, um, your first so-called three-year retreat isn't done um, continuously, or, or most people don't do it continuously. Uh, pe most people would cover the curriculum over a period of five, six, seven years. Meaning every year they might take three months, uh, then come back out uh, and serve the monastery, uh, being assigned to different tasks, uh, serving the monastery. And then next year, if they are lucky, if they have permission, they do another six months instead of three months. Then they come back out again and serve the monastery. Uh, and then they might be able to go in the next year for a month uh, and, and finish like different parts of the curriculum. Here, they are not given any 
teachings explicitly on Mahamudra uh, for a good number of years, uh, including um, not given much instructions on the dis dissolution stage. Uh, simply the teacher will say, okay, uh, for dissolution, uh, if you're doing your uh, accumulation of uh, prostrations for refuge, uh, just think uh, the guru uh, dissolve into you. And you dissolve. And actually, the teacher doesn't explain more than that uh, and say, just, just do that. So then you do 100,000 prostrations, you know. And during that time, you, you think, oh, teacher says dissolve. Uh, then you go kind of dissolve. And actually, you don't know, you know. You're like, dissolve. Hmm. What does dissolve mean? You might go back to the teacher and say, well, what, what does dissolve mean? Huh? And depending on the teacher and the teacher's ability, the teacher will say, it's this or it's that, and you may or may not understand. And the teacher basically says, now go back. Huh? Don't come out until you have finished 50,000 prostrations. And then you go and you continue. Right? You're at 5,000. Now you have 45,000 to go. And each session still, you know, you're dissolved. Hmm. What does dissolve mean? Doesn't matter. After your 50,000, you come back and you say, oh, does dissolve mean blah, blah, blah? Well, depending on what you say, the teacher might say, it's blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then maybe you have another question, you go back, you know, and you continue to do your practice. In this way, the teacher is guiding you through getting glimpses, mini, mini glimpses of it. And so you, 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 you sort of get a little bit, but you continue. Okay, next, 100,000 Vajrasattva recitations. Again, teachers say, okay, uh, you and Vajrasattva in the end become inseparable. And then you're like, inseparable? What do you mean inseparable? You continue right, doing your Vajrasattva. And then, you know, you go back and you check with the teacher. Is it, you know? So it's through this process, yeah? at least this is at Dugong Til Monastery, uh, where the retreat master uh, is said to be uh, th that retreat master is not like, you know, what everybody now has titled retreat master. But that retreat master at Drigong Til Monastery, Rajarin Bhaja has said, you know, this is uh, every generation, Kyopa Jigden Sumgun emanates. This is a poetic way of saying the retreat master at Drigong Til, you know, is no different from Jigden Sumgun's understanding and realization. And even such a master, you know, it's not like, oh, I have found you. Now show me the mind. <laughs> Actually, it's a process too. It's a process. So after this, uh, the initial three-year retreat, which might be spread out six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Because again, the notion is that you need to serve the monastery. And in that way, you purify negative karma. And while serving the monastery, oh, you will get yelled at. People will complain about you. Uh, people will spread rumors about you. Uh, just the nature of community living. And if you understand all of that as purifying, uh, as cutting your ego, instead of like, oh, when can I go into a retreat? Oh, God, I'm wasting my time here. Oh, this is terrible. But if you understand, you know, working in the community, uh, getting uh, praise, getting blamed, all of that uh, becomes means of purifying. Then you go back into retreat. Then you come out. Uh, sometimes uh, you think, I want to do three months. You know, after a month and a half, uh, the monastery say, hey, we need you to come back and, you know, cook in the kitchen. Uh, then you have to cancel and you go back. Um, that doesn't happen a lot, but it happens, you know. Go in again, out, in, out. And after uh, the, the 
content of the first three-year retreat is completed, at a certain point there, if all goes well, the teacher will do a more direct introduction to nature of mind. It's not that you know, the teacher is stingy before this, but it's that the student has no capacity to recognize. And so when the teacher can tell, uh, now the time is ripe, uh, then the teacher might attempt uh, to do the introduction. Whether or not the student would recognize depends, you know. Maybe another mini recognition. Then again, purification needs to be done. But when finally the teacher is satisfied, like, yes, I have introduced, and yes, you have successfully recognized, then the next set of three-year retreat at Dragon Tier, that's the uninterrupted, solitary three years. You, you, you rarely go see even the retreat master. Then for three years, uninterruptedly, you are habituating. Then after the three years, you might come out for a little bit, go see the retreat master, and then the retreat master might say, you know, let's try three more years, continue to habituate, then more and more, you know, and that's, <laughs> that's a lifelong process. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, it's also not, you know, like um, a zap of lightning, you know, like, oh, I realized my nature of the mind, the teacher just pointed it out to me, yay. <laughs> and I've seen, I have seen, uh, uh, I've heard, I've seen, uh, Teachers like Gacha Rinpoche, uh, Trangu Rinpoche, and Gamakagyu, you know, they have said, they said, actually, if your devotion is strong and you have really good store of karma, even by reading the words of the past masters, yeah, the pointing out can happen. Uh, now, I, I have not had a chance to explicitly ask, uh, and and the introduction that happens this way, is it complete introduction is possible? Or, you know, a glimpse of a glimpse, you know? I, I, I don't know, you know? I, I didn't get a chance to directly ask either Trangu Rinpoche or Gajan Rinpoche, you know? But they have said, they said, you know, e even like you're reading eh, Mahamudra texts, if the student's eh, merit is really strong, and then the devotion to you know, whoever this you know, great master's Mahamudra text, you know, whether it's Gyopajik Densumgun, whether it's Dilopa, whether it's you know, uh, one of the Karmapas, or, you know, uh, they say, you know, actually, it can happen. Now, of course, what cannot happen is uh, you cannot go check, you know, with, with the author of this book. <laughs> In the way that you could check if you have uh, the kind of teacher that we're talking about here. And, and, and I have to confess, like, I think unfortunately I feel for us, mm, we, we don't, not unfortunately, I, I don't think we should look at it that way, but I, I, let me put it, rephrase that and say, we have to be realistic, you know, like uh, uh, this works when we have the circumstance of living and training under this teacher, where we actually have uh, that kind of connection.
but that's not the circumstance of most of us uh, these days. And so, so then, to me, it's encouraging uh, to, to know uh, uh, that it is possible to catch some glimpse, uh, some glimpse of some glimpse uh, through uh, reading. And the main point is to continue uh, to polish away whatever we can polish away. But don't get hung up on like, oh, I need introduction to nature of mind. I need introduction to nature of mind. I need my sudden uh, realization. In that sense, you know, that realization is sudden. You cannot plan it. You cannot orchestrate it. And you cannot force it. Okay, so we end today, uh, past 11 now. Um, I might have to go help someone get their medicine. Uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, so uh, I want to have a change of actually our schedule. Uh, I think right now, um, we're not going to do this every day uh, because... I'm about to start another uh, practice support. Um, and I don't think I'm able to do both uh, every day. So I'm going to alternate these uh, to every other day. So we'll meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, for a few weeks. On Saturday, Sunday, we will not meet because, again, I have things that I have to support on Saturday, Sunday. I'm finding that it's a little uh, challenging for me to do so many. Um, so we'll do Monday, Wednesday, Friday from now on. Uh, and some of you I know like Mondays you cannot attend, but all of this are recorded and uploaded uh, within 12 hours. Uh, that's my goal. Uploaded on the YouTube channel, uh, the Gung Dhamma Kirti Circle. Uh, please subscribe to that so that every time we have added something, uh, you will know. Um, and so we'll do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, then sometimes, you know, if my schedule clears up, you know, I might say, oh, tomorrow, yeah, we will have. But until it is announced, uh, this program, we will meet Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, same time from 9 to 11. Okay. Chan Thank you. Have a good day. Please take care of yourself. Please good, be good to each other, to the people around you. Check in on other people who might need help or who might just need a word of hello. How are you? Uh, so please do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Ta -ta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Adiós. Chao. Gracias.